In this video I'd like to explore the menus and some of the basic features to help you prepare your work area and set it up to begin your first digitizing. I will skip a lot of uh, information here but so I'm trying to isolate it down to that information I think is most important to you. So let's start at the help menu and we'll go to the reference manual. Now the reference manual is a 1298 page PDF document with a search facility here so find with a little magnifying glass in you can see that I've been searching for the words hand stitched so anywhere where those words appear in the manual it'll appear for you and you can study up on that topic however the main reason to bring you to, to this uh, manual was to show you two uh, areas that I'm asked about a lot one is uh, fonts so that's under the appendices menu and you go to embroidery fonts and they've been broken down into different uh, blocks different types of of fonts so I'm always asked a lot of questions about small fonts and what I'd like to show you here that every font has a, a recommended minimum and maximum size and some of their ranges are quite small others quite large you'll see that the miniature block has got a minimum recommended size of 5 mil with a maximum of only 6 mil so a fairly small range whereas small Cooper has a range of 6 up to 50 millimeters it pays to be familiar with with those settings remember you can print these pages out if you wish to the other area that I would like to show you is the shortcuts that's under quick reference keyboard shortcuts there are three pages of these you know I suggest you do print these three pages out and learn a couple of shortcuts each day they're not difficult most or many of them are the same as your Windows shortcuts control C V control N etc but some are, uh, are peculiar to to work on B for marquee zoom etc okay so that's the manual under the help menu you've got uh, just links back to the work on page so let's go to the window menu now and the important thing here is your to display and hide your toolbars to do that just click beside the the name of the toolbar you want opened and as you check it or uncheck it it will appear or disappear I find this really handy oftentimes the work area can get quite crowded so by going to the toolbar and checking or, or switching off and turning on the toolbar you'll see where it changes in the work area and it's more easy to identify that a shortcut to get to the same place is simply right click in the menu area but not on a menu and the toolbar selection will appear so that's right clicking in the in the menu area setup options there are many features you can turn on or off in these 11 tabs including guides scrolling hoops in this presentation I'd like to concentrate on the general tab and look at some of the features that are included here the auto save feature I recommend that you have it checked to save every 10 minutes and always create a backup copy and, and the software will save these EMA or EMB files to a particular folder so that you can retrieve them later in the event that the software is closed down by mistake or, or there's a computer crash it'll the software will do its best to save those files for you when we get back over to the file menu I'll show you how to reopen those we don't need to worry about uh, showing values at the moment apply changes immediately have that checked the closest join feature I advise you I recommend that you have that checked and I'll show you what that does just use my rectangle tool and you'll see when it's completed the last stitch in this object is where the red cross is now I'll digitize another object starting over here and you'll see that the last point of this object has now been moved to as close as it can get to the beginning stitch of the following object so that's what closest join is about just if I move that to here the start end points remain where they were here's a nice little shortcut for you to remember if I select both of those objects and hit J on my keyboard, the letter J, that'll change the start and finish point. So it's now moved the end point of the first object to the top corner 
and the starting point of the second object to the bottom left corner. So back to the setup menu and options and play sounds. I recommend you turn that off. If you don't, you'll hear a beep and bonking sound as you left and right click uh, and it can be quite annoying. Cumulative stitch count, don't worry about. The crosshair cursor, I really like that. It allows me to reference previously digitized objects or points. So let's say I want to line up another object to line up with the left, the right hand end of that uh, left hand square and line up the right hand side of the top square. The crosshair cursor allows me to do that. Okay, so that's the crosshair cursor as opposed to just having the, po the uh, pointer for the cursor. Show your home screen at startup and check for updates. We'll look at the home screen a little later on and checking for updates is, is a good idea because it'll keep you current with the any free updates. Uh, I'll look at the insert embroidery file later. The options here are if I was to import another file into this work area, do I want to add the colors that are in the file that I'm importing to this palette or do I want to match the colors that are in the imported file to the palette? So I'll demonstrate that a little later. Digitizing tools, just leave that at normal. Uh, toolbars, show tool names and large icons. If you're brand new to it and you want to name these icons and you've got a, a high def monitor, you could choose these options and you can see that it's now easy to identify each of the tools. And because you've got a high def screen, uh, you should have enough room to accommodate these enlarged icons, but you can see on my monitor here it's taken up a lot of room so I just can't afford to do that and you, you will get used to these tools without having them the names there but it's a good place to start so go back to options under the general tab and I'll turn those off we won't worry about this at the moment okay some of those settings uh, you can access simply by right clicking on their icon in the view toolbar so that brings us to the grids and guidelines tab. If I right click on the hoops, it'll bring me to the setup in, setting up of hoops. Just another way to get to the same place. The graphics toolbar, I'll just work, I'll get to a new area and I'll import a graphic. There's a number of ways to do this, but I'll just go to the file menu, import a graphic and uh, let's say this one here. Now if I want to, this is a bitmap or a raster file, if I go to the graphics menu, I want to show you how to crop a bitmap. So you can see you've got a whole range of shapes and that you can use to, to crop a bitmap. I'm going to use any shape. So I simply click around the shape that I want to retain. And when I've completed this, you'll see that the rest of the design will have disappeared. So I just hit enter once and you can see that only those pine trees had been displayed. The interesting thing is that you can still see the handles of the original piece of uh, paper or the scanned image. So what's happened here is that the image, this part of the image has simply been hidden. It's still in fact there. So if we come back to the graphics menu, we can say remove the crop. And the reason for that is this is multi-decoration software now and the lines around the globe may, for example, need to be screen printed or to be made up of sequence or some other decor decoration method. So we don't want to get rid of the whole design just while we're digitizing the pine trees to make it clearer. So I go through that, I control Z to undo that so we've got the soft crop. And if you want this to be a permanent crop, simply come back to finalize the crop and you'll see that the the handles have been reduced and you can it, that that's all that's available okay i think we can skip the stitch function arrange object and we'll look at the design menu the only thing i want to look at here is the background and display colors uh, normally i would simply access the same area by left clicking on what i call the rubik's cube at the bottom uh, at the left hand end of the color palette and here you can set up your 
your background colors um, selected stitches make pink I'll change the unsewn stitches to a bright green to demonstrate that and I'll make the needle points black or a dark color plum color okay so back to our first design if I select an object with my pick tool it turns bright pink okay if I travel to the beginning of the design okay so sorry I changed that property for the other design the work area what I should have done is saved it to the template so we'll change this to a bright color again and needle points to plum okay so I can tell I'm now at the beginning of the design for a number of reasons. One, it is bright green. The other one is in my prompt toolbar or my status toolbar. It's telling me that I'm at stitch one. As I advance to the end of the design, the design takes on the colors that have been selected for it. I'll just change the color of that object there so you can see it's, it's, it's true colors. Travel back to the beginning of the design so nothing is stitched. It is bright green because that's the property I've selected here in my black background and display colors and in my view toolbar I've selected to show needle points and you can see because I've made them a plum color they display much more clearly than if they were say a white color Okay, so it's difficult to see because we've got a white background. So that's your background and display colors, and there's more features that you can uh, work with here. You can experiment with fabrics and show fabric inside a hoop, etc. But that's the basic settings. I like to see anything selected to be a bright pink or a bright color, anything unsewn, another uh, probably uncommon but bright color, and our guidelines to be bright blue so that it can be seen easily on a white background. To get rid of our guidelines click in the head and just drag away okay so that now brings us to our file menu and all of these should look fairly familiar open the design open recent designs uh, open the backup now this is what I was referring to before when I said the software saves emergency files open up a backed up design so it'll look into a particular folder where old files have been stored okay so I can open that them up and 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 use them again so that's where you would open up those emergency files I'll just mention here too it's a good idea to remove those backup files when they're no longer useful in other words when you've saved them to their permanent position so if you look in the Wilcom suite in your or programs list you can add the purge and recover to your start menu or into the taskbar at the bottom so I'll just activate that little dialog box will come up select delete backup files okay so that's just a bit of housekeeping that you can do from time to time I place that icon on my desktop and all my taskbar just to remind me to do that now we're back we'll travel to the folder and you can see that backup folder is now empty okay the other areas here you can save as if you're saving uh, to an EMB file you would simply select save or save as save as gives you the opportunity to give the design a name and you would navigate to where you want the file to be stored documents or your design file or, or wherever you would normally uh, save your files to okay that's for EMB files if you're saving to a machine file if you're exporting a machine file to a USB stick ready to put onto a uh, take to the embroidery machine you would export a machine file and you'd select from the drop down here and tell it what file type you want to export you know most more, more commonly would be a DST or a DSB or a, a U01 file for Baroud machines and you've got special design uh, types for ZSKs, Gens, Jeffs for some of the domestic machines. These two icons wirelessly transfer designs to your embroidery machine with Wilcom's new 
Embroidery Connect Wi-Fi device. Remember earlier in the video under the setup options, we were able to decide whether we wanted to add the colors to a, the existing palette or match colors to the existing palette when we're inserting an embroidery file. So we've currently got add colors to the palette selected. So I'll just cancel this. So in this design here, we are using gem colors. And this one here, we're using Kingstar colors. I'll close this design down. Okay, and I'll drag this back to the main area there. Okay, so we've got Kingstar colors. File, import embroidery. I'll point to the file with the gem colors. I'll just drag it up sideways there. So we have the fishing design selected and those uh, color chips with the black box around are, are the colors that belong to it. And you can see that we bought the colors that belong to that design and added them to the palette. So I select the deep sea logo. They are still king, king star colors. Okay, so let me get rid of the fishing design again. Delete. We we'll go to our setup options, and this time we'll say match to the current palette. So we'll change the colors of the of the design that we're going to import. So we'll import file import design. And you can see now that we've matched to the King Star colors in the current palette. And finally, in this overview, I'd like to look at the home page, which you can access from the mode toolbar. From the mode toolbar, you can begin new designs, open recent designs. All the things that we were able to do in the workspace is just another avenue for you. But what I'd like to draw your attention to today is the tutorials. Uh, there's a whole list of videos that you can access to learn about stitching a lettering, for example. So we'll search lettering. These are the lettering videos that have come up. Uh, so watch, watch those. And the other area I'd like you to look at is the actual blog, where there are articles written that include the videos that I've just pointed you to. So for example, we'll just search lettering. And anything basic lettering. So there's an article written to describe how you create the lettering. And then the video that you could access back in the tutorials. Now what I recommend you do here, if you haven't already, subscribe to the blog so that when there are new articles and videos added, you'll be informed. So thanks very much for watching. I know this has been a long video, but uh, you may want to watch it in, in parts and come back to it. There's lots of information here. And please, uh, I'll add this to the blog. Please let me know if there's any other information you'd need. I'll put a, a form for you to make any requests at the bottom of the blog. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and catch your next video.